Anyway, so I think a lot of you do know who John Ross Bowie is. He's been in uh, the industry for quite some time now. Um, he, like I said, you might know him as Dan the Wiccan, Wiccan, sorry. Dad Rhyme right there. Uh, the Father on the Speechless, which is a particularly good show, especially as I have a goddaughter in a wheelchair. And I thought that you guys were stealing plot lines from her parents every week. <laughs> um, and of course, Kripke on Big Bang Theory. Uh, John has been in the business. He worked with three camera setups, individual camera setups. Um, I guess we'll start with the question of, you know, what's a typical week like for you when you're working in a three camera setup TV show? Um, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is super exciting and a, a wonderful disruption of my routine. And um, I mentioned this morning to my wife that um, uh, we were going to talk about a, a typical day and she was like, good God, right now? I'm like, no, no, not a typical day right now because that's, you know, I get up when I get up. I sort of have coffee, you no, know, like a day actually at work. Um, so yeah, as Brian said, I've, I've, I've worked on about 10 different multicams, only probably one of which you've heard of. Um, uh, and I've done a lot of, um, of single cam, um, uh, and I don't think we have to go too deep into the distinction between the two, although I will say that over the past few years, single cam has become a little bit, a bit of a misnomer, and you'll cover a lot of shots um, like this over, over two people's shoulders so you can save time and get honest reactions and not have to just do one person's coverage, turn around to another person's coverage while this person, the first person, is just sort of blandly reading their lines. It leads to a more immediate type of performance. But the, uh, the multicam sitcom as popularized by Lucille Ball and um, other pioneers in the, uh, in the early 1950s has not really changed much in terms of its production schedule over the past 60 years. Um, a, a typical week, and we can get into how one gets a job uh, uh, in the in the medium, in terms of uh, in front of or behind the camera, we can get into that in a moment. But a typical week, um, let's say it's a Monday to Friday, um, it takes five days to make an episode of multicam television. Uh, it usually takes five days to make a half hour uh, um, of a single cam, but you are shooting that whole time. On a multicam, you will shoot one occasionally two days. Um, Monday you will come in, um, it's an amazing schedule. It's a terrific schedule if you're looking at. It's a terrific schedule because you'll show up on the first day around 10 a.m. and you will have a table read. And the table read will be attended by the cast, obviously. All the writers will be off to the side. Um, uh, some key members of the crew, um, uh, hair, makeup, wardrobe, uh, uh, the director of photography, but probably not the camera ops. Um, all the heads of the various departments, set construction, will all be there just to get an idea of what will be expected of them that week. Now, if there's any major construction that has to go on, like if we have to like build a gym set, the set, the set department will have advanced notice of such a thing. But for the most part, everyone gets together Monday morning, 10 a.m., and we read that week's script. Uh, and that will take about as long as you think it will. It'll take about 30 minutes. It'll take a little bit longer than the average episode. Average episode right now is, I think, 22 minutes with, uh, for network. Um, that's counting, you know, that's because you have like eight minutes of commercials now. Um, so you'll read the, uh, the episode, um, uh, either the director or the showrunner, executive producer will, will read the stage directions. You'll take a quick break um, and then you will start rehearsing, unless the table read went incredibly poorly, which happens sometimes, in which case the writers head back to the room to fix what is broken and they often don't bother rehearsing if it's going to change that drastically. Um, now, on a show that was as well-oiled a machine as Big Bang, usually we would just take a quick break and start rehearsing because the script wasn't going to change that drastically. But on shows that are in there, uh, I've done a lot of shows that were canceled after one season. So um, <laughs> the, uh, the, there'll be a lot of times there where they're trying to figure out what the show is and, and who the characters are, at which point um, 
the studio and network will come in with a ton of notes. The script will have to be radically rewritten. And rather than rehearse stuff that is just going to be thrown out the window, they will send you home Monday. So Tuesday, you go in, you will hopefully get a new script. Um, when I started, you got a new script via messenger. Now you get a, a PDF in your email, obviously. Um, and you show up um, at a reasonable hour, like eight or nine a.m. on Tuesday, and you start rehearsing. You will not always, you're gonna shoot the show in order on Friday night. You will not always shoot, you will not always rehearse in order. You'll often rehearse set by set just so they can kind of keep everything organized. Um, and not have to have people running back and forth along the, the big sound stage. Um, and I, you guys have had, you guys, I understand, have some production facilities at Malloy, so you have an idea of what it looks like. There's, you know, a, a battery of sets, and then on the other side, there's, there's actual bleacher seating with a huge space in between the two where the cameras and such can, can roll around. Um, so you rehearse on Tuesday. And uh, in the afternoon, you will do a run through for writers and producers, producers run through. Um, and you will do that in order. You will do that in the order that the show will be uh, shot and aired. And you, you, you walk through everything. And it means you, everyone does get up and move from set to set. Um, so you've got this sort of, um, it's like this weird immersive theater piece where you, you do a scene and then the audience follows you to the next set and you do the next scene. Um, you will have, uh, there will be, have been some changes in the script. You'll do that and the writers will see if anything else needs to be tweaked. And that is your Tuesday. Wednesday, it starts to get a little more, uh, uh, it starts to get a little busier. You will come in and you will rehearse um, and you are gearing up towards a studio and network run through where all those executives who came to the Monday table read are now going to want to see this thing on its feet so they can give notes or uh, offer support or probably the first one, give notes. So you come in eight or nine in the morning um, and you rehearse all day. So it's very much like you're doing a play a week, which is... Um, uh, incredibly fun. You get incredibly comfortable with the words. You get inc incredibly comfortable with the jokes, provided they don't change that much. And you have a real, that sort of dynamic sense of doing, of doing theater and, and rehearsing a, a one-act play um, uh, over the course of five days. Uh, that afternoon, around two or three in the afternoon, the studio and network will come in and uh, the executives and the writers will watch you do a, uh, a run-through. Um, and uh, we'll offer notes often after each scene. So it's a sort of a, a herky-jerky way to rehearse. So you, you do the scene, and um, you're still allowed to have your script in hand by this point. So everyone's kind of reading off of scripts because we've only had a couple of days to get off book with this stuff. And uh, then the writers will undergo another round of notes, and maybe the script will change that evening. Thursday is when the cameras show up. Thursdays, the cameras show up and you start, you've got all of the actor blocking down at this point. You know where you're supposed to be standing. You know where you're supposed to go so you don't bump into furniture. This is the time now for the cameras to, uh, to figure out where they have to be. And you'll notice when you watch multicam, um, as a rule, the camera doesn't move very much. These are not David Fincher movies. These are, these are the camera is very stationary and they move when they're not actually shooting. So, you know, we'll switch to this wide shot and the close up will, will move while, while the camera's not actually being used. So you don't see a lot of like sweeping pans or zooms with rare exceptions uh, in the multicam medium. So they've all got to kind of figure out their little dance. Uh, and there's three or sometimes four cameras, uh, in front of each uh, set and they, they move around with the cast and uh, camera blocking takes quite a long time and there's a lot of math involved and it's one of many reasons I've d decided that I'm not gonna be one of those actors who wants to direct because it's a whole, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of logistics to be dealt with there. The other thing you will do on Thursday is you will do some pre-shoots if needed. Now a pre-shoot is pretty much what it sounds like. You will shoot something before the actual tape night. Um, one, because it's gonna be on a set that would not be visible to the audience, so there's no point in doing it in front of an audience. Uh, on the rare occasion, you have to take your shoot outside 
which again, doesn't happen very often on multicam, but um, if you need to do something in a field or at a the sporting event or what have you, um, or at, you know, we occasionally they would actually bring the cameras to Caltech, um, uh, which is where Big Bang Theory ostensibly took place. I don't think they ever actually said the name, but it was understood that it was a large science university in Pasadena. It was the California Technical, uh, Technological Institute. Um, they would uh, sometimes go and shoot there. For instance, if they had to shoot with Professor Stephen Hawking, they would go to his offices in Pasadena and shoot there rather than have him go to Warner Brothers for what I think is fairly obvious reasons. Um, the, um, so you'll do the pre-shoots on Thursday as well. Uh, and it's a little weird because you're, you're doing these things without the audience, but often the camera guys will be good sports and they will laugh in lieu of the audience, which is uh, appreciated more than words can say. Friday, you get a late start. Friday, um, everyone comes in probably around noon. You will rehearse again and you will do one final run through uh, in front of the producers who will just kind of tweak and these are just finely tuned notes. Like, you know, John, maybe try and take a beat before this word. Um, uh, you can hold that pause a little bit longer. Um, just, you know, tiny little, um, again, fine tunings, um, as if you're putting the finishing touches on a painting or something. Um, I'm making it sound a lot more artistic than perhaps it is, but that's the basic idea, fine tuning. Um, you will, uh, uh, break for dinner, depending on where the cast is and their interpersonal relationships. The cast will eat together, or they'll just scurry off to their dressing rooms and eat by themselves. It's a show-by-show -show scenario there. Um, and then what Big Bang would do and what quite a lot of other shows would do is you'll do a speed-through in the makeup room where everyone gets together and races through the... Everyone's off book by this point, or should be, and everyone just races through, bounces through each uh, each scene real quick, and you try to bang out a 22 episode, a 22 minute episode in about 12 or 13 minutes with everyone just doing the lines as quickly as they can to make sure everyone's got it down. While this is going on, the audience is being loaded in. There's a warm up uh, comic uh, at the front of the bleachers who is getting the audience riled up, um, showing them where everything is going to be, giving them a little history of the show, uh, making sure their cell phones are off, et cetera, et cetera. And then around six o'clock, they introduce the series regular cast in a big, uh, and this is any, uh, any multicam does this. Um, uh, the big ceremony, everyone comes out, they wave, they bow, and then you start shooting. The shoot for a multicam can take anywhere from three to five hours. It will, there are exceptions to that rule. Once in a great while, my wife is gesturing longer. It depends though, it depends on the show, because we could bang out a big bang in two and a half hours. That thing was a finely oiled machine. Everything else, Everything else is closer to five, close to sometimes six. Pizza for the audience is you have to legally provide pizza for the audience at the four hour mark. I will fight you, woman. My wife is also in the business. She'd have some fucking nerve talking to me like this if she was a CPA. She is also in the business. I've been on plenty of unsuccess. They've heard of exactly one multicam sitcom that I have done. Raise your hand if anyone here watched Happy Family in 2003. Were any of you alive? Okay, my point exactly. Um, trust me. So anyway, there are, there are some times where it will go so long that they will send the audience home while they're trying to figure out how something works. Now, let's talk for a moment about tape night. Tape night is exhilarating and incredibly fun, and it's sort of what I've always likened it to is theater with a safety net. You are doing a show in makeup in front of an audience. If on the off chance you fuck up, you have a chance to do it again, hence the safety net. And the audience, provided you don't abuse this privilege, the audience is kind of excited to have seen a blooper. So that's kind of a fun, like, oh, man, we saw, you know, whenever Jim Parsons would fuck up, the audience would just be shocked because the man was just a machine by, like, the third season on that show. Whenever, whenever Sheldon bluffed a line, everyone was like, oh, my God, we've just seen a unicorn. Um, the... Um, Sometimes you will do a joke that has been killing absolutely all week and it just dies. For whatever reason, this audience is not feeling that joke and the audience, the uh, writers will, will huddle 
and they will either have some alt or alternate lines ready for you, or they will write some on the fly. They will bring them over to you in front of the audience. They will whisper them to you. They will ask you to say it back to them, and then you just shoot it. Those jokes are, first off, it's, it's the closest thing I'm ever going to come to any sort of like major sporting event doing well in any sort it's like a hail mary pass for me the closest i will ever come to like making the catch that saves the game is delivering an alt line because i am not an athlete so it's kind of exciting to have that moment of here we need you to fix this joke you're the only one who can do it you feel it's very it's all very diehard um and hopefully that joke the new one will work but sometimes it just you know for whatever reason the audience is not feeling it and rather than keep the audience you know, past the five or six hour mark, at which point you're just dealing with a lot of diminishing returns, they'll send them home and they'll add laughter from other, from other jokes or from other tapings uh, at another time. Uh, they'll, they'll add it in while they're editing. Um, yes, if you keep the audience for a certain amount of time, I believe it's four hours, you do have to give them pizza. Um, and nowadays you have to offer some vegan and gluten-free options as well. Uh, which is as it should be. I think that is a more inclusive audience. Um, but the, um, uh, so the taping is again, about three to five hours um, uh, with exceptions to, to that. Um, and then at the end of the evening, everybody, um, series regular cast and guest cast comes out and takes a bow and the audience is sent home and everyone shakes hands and gets uh, a, a, uh, often a hard copy of the following week's script. And um, you start over uh, the following Monday. A um, couple uh, key things to distinguish. Uh, the exceptions to this are um, Apparently by the end of Friends, they had a three-day work week. They would show up, they would, and again, <laughs> the Friends were making a great deal of money, but they had a three-day work week and they would do the table read and most of their rehearsing on Wednesday, camera block Thursday, shoot Friday. Um, every once in a while, Big Bang would have a shorter week, but not as often. Um, often because there were all sorts of like scientific and logical things that had to be figured out throughout the week and they wanted to make sure that everyone had their stuff. Big Bang's the only, only show I ever got that had a glossary at the beginning of the script. You, got a, you had a page of um, scientific and unfamiliar terms um, because you had you know, six people with theater degrees uh, pretending to be physicists and uh, uh, there was a lot of pronunciation issues uh, that had to be addressed. Um, um, what else can I tell you? We can talk a little bit about the audition process, but this is mostly a production class. And I, I felt like it would behoove us to focus more on that. Um, uh, Dr. Kogan, um, yeah. your, your thoughts, your uh, questions, um, what have I missed? Well, thank you so much for like the week by the week rundown. Cause I think a lot of, has anyone here raised your hand if you've ever been to any live programming, whether it's like um, The View, Today Show, et cetera. Okay. What have you seen, Bernadette? Um, I went to MTV taping once of TRL, but it wasn't really like, it was cool, but it wasn't like, I don't know. It was like live, so. Okay, so it wasn't uh, you're there for five hours or six hours. Actually, it wasn't live. It was like one of the performances. They had us like in the crowd for, um, like a band that was performing. Oh, cool. But it was really cool. Yes, and you get you get some idea of I mean, I think that's in a lot of ways that's that's um that's almost gonna run smoother, uh because you know the band is obviously going to be super well rehearsed before it shows up and and you know the the hosts just have to do their banter thing. Um but still you get an idea of like all the moving parts. Um where did they um can I ask where they shot that? Um, it was at the Viacom building in New York City. Oh, sure, right. 1515 Broadway, right there mm -hmm. on, uh, I grew up down the street from that building. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, you're not, you guys are the only native New Yorkers. Um, and then there was somebody up here, Courtney, you had seen something. Yeah, I went to go see, um, SNL. Oh, was, cool. Because they have, like, cue cards and stuff. They did have to run, run through, like you said, like, the week, um, 
schedule, it's very similar. It is very similar. They they get to use cue cards because the jokes change constantly and there's just a lot of stuff going on there. If you notice the, if you watch that show and you keep an eye on the eye lines, the eye lines are all over the place. People are never, they do what they can to kind of cheat it with the camera, but people are never looking at each other. They're always kind of looking off here and delivering their, their lines. I went to an SNL taping uh, in the eighties actually um, uh, after Lorne Michaels had just come back. God, this is 85. Chevy Chase was hosting, and Brian, the musical guest, was Sheila E. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. That's a really, I mean, SNL is its own thing. That is a, that is like a combat zone um, compared to the the relative uh, smoothness of a uh, of a multicam. Because again, they have ninety minutes live. Um, what they they've started airing it live even on the West Coast. Um, we actually get it early. Uh, we get it at 8.30 now, um, if we want it. I mean, I don't know who's watching anything live anymore, but we, if we want it, we get it at 8.30. What they used to do is they would film the dress rehearsal and the live show, and then if something went really badly in the live show, they would use the dress rehearsal version for the West Coast feed, um, which I always found kind of interesting. And they, they don't have that luxury anymore. They've decided that they're going to air it so the whole the whole country gets it live and immediate, which is is fun and exciting, and is the way television used to be. Have you done live TV, John? No, yeah, well, I don't think I have. Have I done live TV? I haven't done any live TV, have I? Okay, but can I mention oh. something about your past? Um, you trained at the Great Citizens Brigade Theater. Yeah, yeah. So you used to well, do I'm sorry, we're, we're we're trying to figure. It. No, I haven't done any. I've done like. No, even like, because I used to do bits on Conan when I was starting out at UCB, but Conan is live to tape. I mean, it, it feels like a, a, a live show, but it's it's not. They, they tape it. Yeah, I've done like morning, I've done live news TV morning shows and stuff like local uh, KTLA live and, and stuff like that, which, um, uh, and the only thing you really have to worry about there is just, if you're me, you just have to just, the mantra inside of your head is don't curse, don't curse, don't curse, don't curse. Don't curse. Which is Brian? You know me. This is a this is a not easy task for me. Um, I wouldn't last a minute on SNL. One thing would go wrong. I'd drop an f bomb, and I just my well, they would clean out my office for me. Um, uh, but yes, I'm sorry, Brian. You were asking something. Okay, so you haven't done live, but you come from a live um, improv background. Yes, you trained at UCB. Uh huh. I started there in in 1998. Okay, so you were you were used to doing live performances. I was used to, yeah, I was used to an audience. I was used to that sort of, the, the key thing, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell an interesting story about multicam acting. Um, the key thing about, about doing any sort of live comedy, be it sketch comedy on TV, be it sketch comedy in a theater, be it a sitcom, is, is that sense of playing with the audience and kind of surfing their laughs and knowing like when a laugh has peaked, so you can come in without wasting too much time and get the next part of your joke in, but also you don't want to step on the laugh, get in there too early, interrupt the audience while they're enjoying themselves, but also you don't want to wait too long um, so that there's a weird gap at the end of the laugh. All of those things, it's very exciting and it's a very, um, uh, there's something very rhythmic about hitting that level of, um, of play with a, a live audience and knowing when they're really enjoying themselves and when you can just, it's time to just shut up and let them laugh. And when it's time to step in with the, with your next line um, and make sure it doesn't get swallowed by their laugh. I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine uh, is a guy named Mark Kuhnerth who worked on friends. Um, he was one of the writers on friends for like there. He, before that he was on Roseanne, he moved over to friends for like friends the last five seasons, I think. And then I met him on the TV show Speechless that Brian mentioned. So he's done a lot of multicam and he's done a lot of single cam uh, writing for, uh, for TV. In between Friends and Speechless, he was working on a family sitcom for TBS that was not really his sensibility, but he's got a kid. He's got, you know, he's got a kid to feed and uh, a mortgage. So he, he was doing something that was not his, um, not necessarily his cup of tea, but he was enjoying himself. And he's a super nice guy. He's really easy to work with. Um, and he enjoyed writing for this, this kind of dopey family sitcom, except there was a, the daughter on the show 
he found was just a dead end. Like you could not give her a joke. She didn't know how to act in front of an audience. She, she wouldn't surf the laughs properly. She would step on other people's jokes. She would deliver lines while the audience was still laughing. So they'd have to go back and retake them. Meanwhile, there was a, his manager was always going, man, I'm telling you that daughter, man, she's incredible. And Mark was like, I don't see what you're, the emperor has no clothes. I do not know what you're talking about. She sucks. I, I, this, she's a disaster. And the manager's like, I don't know, man, she's got something. You can kind of see where this is going. Anyway, the Bill Engvall show, which is what it was called, gets canceled. And the daughter um, books a role in Winter's Bone, and then she gets the lead in The Hunger Games. And then she wins an Oscar for, what did, she, what did Jennifer Lawrence win an Oscar for? Was it um, the, uh, the, the, the David Lines. O. Russell? Silver Lines Playbook, right, right. Silver Lines Playbook. Silver Lines Playbook, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence wins an Oscar and Mark's manager calls Mark the next morning to be a dick about it and goes, all right, what do you think about Jennifer Lawrence now? And Mark, God love him, goes, still wouldn't cast her in a multicam. All that to say, all that to say that it is a, it's a craft. There is something to it that is not easy and you don't realize how hard it is until you see it done poorly. Well, John, can I ask if, you, is, when you've done films, like for example, you're really funny as Dan the Wiccan. How do you keep up that energy? How do you keep up like, you know, that scene going when, you know, is the crew laughing at all? Is it just- Well, they're not allowed to while the film's rolling. You know, it's, um, uh, Dan the Wiccan is a, a character I played in a movie called, uh, um, uh, he's just not that into you, in a scene with Jennifer Aniston, who was one of the giants of multicam comedy and it as, um, uh, honestly, what kept me going there was watching was watching Jennifer Aniston straight man me the way she would straight man Matthew Perry, and that was like, oh my god, I've I've arrived. This is the greatest moment of my life. Also, at the risk of just being a big dumb guy, she's got a ridiculous timing, but it's also like looking into the sun. She's got the most beautiful eyes. Anyway, neither the point, neither the, the place, nor the time. But what keeps you going at times like that is just a certain amount of of weird unfounded confidence. You just kind of hope it's working. You hope that the director gives you a thumbs up between takes. Um, you're acting in a vacuum. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a weird way to work and it's how most things get done. Um, you know, you try to make, you, know, you try, to, it, try to get the, the grip who's on his 11th hour of work to stifle a laugh and you just hope that there's little clues like this that, that uh, tell you that you're doing the right thing. Um, they let us improvise a little bit in that scene. Um, uh, so that kept a certain amount of spontaneity going and they had me make up a bunch of Wiccan specifics um, while I was hitting at Jennifer Aniston on a wedding at a wedding. Um, um, I was telling my wife this the other day that I have actually been in several scenes in films and TV that are solely the, the main purpose of the scene is to show the audience how hard it is to be a single woman out there. <laughs> like there, I'll be in like the horrible dating montage of like this shitty boyfriend is what's waiting for you. Sure is tough to be single. And I've done a, an alarming amount of those. An alarming amount of gigs where I play the uh, the the guy who proves to you that um, uh, the single life is is miserable and dating sucks because of guys like me. I try not to overthink it. John, I want to give them time to ask questions. Um, sure. Yo, how where, where are we on time? By the way, are we going to uh, noon? Minutes, but can I ask you to give a condensed version of your origin story, like how you got into the business, how you started to get like you know better roles. Um. Yeah, I'll condense it as best I can. Um, um, ba, 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 ba. All right, so 1998. Um, yes, my band breaks up. Um, uh, uh, how we broke up when we were when we were opening for bands like the In Crowd, I will never know. My band. I will never know. Um, I'm assuming that was part of your origin story as well, Dr. Kogan. Um, so I I had not I had no acting experience. Um, I I'd done a friend's student film in college. Um, and I loved it, but I was deeply, deeply embarrassed and ashamed to admit that I wanted to be an actor um, for myriad reasons, um, some of which is just my own psychology, which we won't get into here, but a lot of it was growing up 
as I said, I grew up on 44th between 9th and 10th. That's the heart of the theater district. I grew up surrounded by actors of varying degrees of success, some of whom were eking out a living in television, some of whom were not, some of whom were waiting tables well into their 40s. And there's no shame in that by any stretch, but it just, I learned from a very early age that it is an incredibly volatile industry. But I had been temping for years at this point. I had taught high school briefly. I had, I was settled into a full-time job as a copywriter writing brochures for the accounting firm of Price Waterhouse and Coopers when a friend of mine from college suggested I start taking improv classes. And I said, fuck no, that sounds terrifying. Nothing scares me more than improv, maybe prison. But he kept on me about it, thank God. Um, and uh, but he might, his name is Andy Secunda. He writes on the Goldbergs right now. He used to write on Conan. He's had a few writing credits. Um, but he kept on, on me about it, and I went into an improv class. Uh, it, since you know, as Brian will attest, being in a band is an incredibly expensive hobby. So once your band breaks up, you've got a ton of disposable income because you're not, you know, renting a van or buying strings or you know, getting your amp repaired. So I had some disposable income, spent it on an improv class and loved it immediately. And um, someone in the class asked me like, oh, so you're an actor? And I said, no. And then, you know, if this was the cheesy movie of my life, the camera would push in on me at this point. I go, huh. Um, so I got, um, uh, I got headshots and I, um, I quit the job at Price Waterhouse and, um, quietly set myself a deadline of um, I was going to try to book a commercial within the first year of after leaving Pricewaterhouse. That was my goal. I was going to just try to book a single commercial. Um, and if I didn't book a commercial within a year, I was going to sit down and like sort of do a reassessment and, you know, Google graduate schools and, you know, have a, a sort of a come to Jesus moment with myself and my career. Um, uh I booked three. It was kind of a fluke, but an agent saw me at um, UCB and started sending me out on commercial auditions. And here's the thing about going out for commercial auditions when you were me in the summer of 1999. Um, there, it was the height of the dot-com boom. And every commercial needed a nerd to personify the dot-com. I'm not kidding. Every commercial needed like a stereotypical nerd to, to be like the face of, of this online tech retailer or um, uh, I did a, a Sprint commercial for the very first cell phone uh, that, with which you could get on the internet. And oh, how we laughed. Who would ever need such a thing? Who would need to check their email more than twice a day? Oh, how we laughed. Um, the... Um, uh, so yeah, I just got really lucky really quickly and, um, and started not just making a little bit of money, but making the sort of money that had me qualify for health insurance within the union. And, and, um, I have, and that's sort of my benchmark, like just make enough money to qualify for the health plan. And I've somehow knock wood been doing that for 21 years now. Uh, so in the beginning of 02, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife and I moved out to Los Angeles um, cause I'd grown up in New York and I still didn't know how to drive and I wanted to take care of those things. I, I couldn't get seen for law and order. And at the time there was really nothing else going on in New York. I think spin city was even done by that point. So there was no production except for law and order and they just would not see me. So I moved out to Los Angeles and the first pilot, this is like the opposite of a cautionary tale. The first pilot I auditioned for, I got, and the audition process for a series regular for a TV pilot is kind of draining. You you go for a pre-read where it's just the casting director, then you go for the producers and they sign off on you. And then you, it's sort of a compressed version of the, of the sitcom work week, really, because you then go in front of the studio and the studio has to sign off on you. And then the network has to sign off on you. And you're doing all the paperwork and you find out what you're going to make for the pilot. And you find out what you're going to make for the next three years if the show goes. So you have every you have every sense of what the stakes are and how much money is on the table when you go in um, for your studio test and your network test. And it's beyond nerve wracking. And somehow uh, my neurotic ass managed to calm myself down to, to do it. 
and my first pilot, it went to series. It aired eight episodes. It died a thousand deaths. Um, we um, we were on against the second season of American Idol, and just we got our asses handed to ourselves week after week. Um, but it was fascinating. It was absolutely my grad school. I regret nothing. I learned so much. Met a lot of good people, um, and that got my proverbial foot in the proverbial door. And after that, it's just been. It's just been, you know, living audition to audition and um, having peaks and valleys. Um, and yeah, here we are. And all of this building towards me eventually speaking to Mr. Kogan's Understanding TV class, which I'm counting as essentially my Emmy. This will be on your CV. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to throw this open now to the students. I just asked the ones that have your cameras off. If you're going to ask a question, please turn your camera on. So if you have a question, put your mic on and your camera on. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have, Brian? We've got, it looks like about 17 minutes. Okay, great. Awesome time. Okay, so who would like to go first? I see Bernadette. Um, you mentioned that like your wife worked in the industry too. What does she do? She uh, and I were both on the same sort of sitcom acting track for years. And um, she would book a lot of uh, very similar stuff, a lot of multicam work, a lot of half hour comedy stuff. And then she and I would occasionally um, show up as a suspect or a witness on an hour long. Um, uh, she has, she's trying to transition. Well, she is, she has transitioned into writing. They keep pulling her back into acting. She is working right now in the writing room, like this instant, she's in a Zoom uh, writer's room. Um, for a new ABC show called Rebel, which is an hour-long legal drama, where she's sort of the um, she's the in-house uh, comedy person uh, to keep the show from taking itself too seriously. So, uh, if any, if a, if a, so, she'll write a script and 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 she'll go into other people's scripts and try to keep it a little a little lighter, so it doesn't turn into uh, uh, so it's an ABC hour lawn and not an HBO hour lawn. If you know what I'm saying, you know it's, it keeps it. Said, don't forget American Princess. She created uh, a show for, uh, that aired uh, last summer on Lifetime called American Princess, which was loosely based on her own experience uh, working at a Renaissance fair in upstate New York. Um, she and I met doing improv. She, we met at UCD, um, which is nice because it's, it's fun to have a, hey, it's nice to have a funny you? wife. Raise your hands if you'd like me to ask her to be a guest star at the class. She'd be a great, because I mean, she'll have a whole different perspective because she's been, she spent so much time in the writer's room of, of a couple of things and has been a showrunner. And as I, I was talking to Brian uh, earlier, she's working right now on developing uh, a story about the era that you guys are studying right now. Uh, she's adapting a book called When Women Ran Television or When Women Created Television. It isn't out yet, but it's about... Um, obviously Lucille Ball, but also uh, the original Mrs. Goldberg, the You Who Mrs. Goldberg sitcom, which you've probably at least read about. You can find some stuff online. Um, the early days of Betty White as a TV show host. She's doing all this. She's become quite the scholar in that field. And uh, yeah, she'd totally be worth uh, worth having. Um, but yeah, so she's, she's uh, focusing on writing, but she also has a recurring acting gig on an AMC show uh, with um, Annie Murphy, who just won an Emmy for Schitt's Creek. So we'll talk after class about trying to book her. Okay. Um, so other questions? Jonathan? Um, do you recommend grad school for anyone who's interested in like acting or any type of production? Or did you kind of do that as a last resort because you were having trouble getting gigs? I, I have not been to grad school. I, uh, I thought about grad school. Um, and then I started working steadily enough that the idea of taking two or three years off seemed really counterproductive. <sighs> Look, grad school, Jesus. You know, there are, for acting, let me put it this way. I know millionaires who have an MFA from really estimable acting schools. And I know millionaires who didn't finish eighth grade. Wow. It's not great news. It's not a, I mean, you, this isn't the partner track at a law firm, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's a really nebulous business, Jonathan. And it, it, there's a, there's a real, um, 
I'm not saying it's not a meritocracy, but there isn't one set path you can take. Um, I think grad school is fun. Here's the thing I regret about not going to, not having, because I have my degrees in English. Um, as I said, I studied to be a high school teacher, which will help you get over stage fright in a big fucking hurry, no question. I mean, you know, once you've taught public high school in New York City, there is no amount of studio audience that's ever going to scare you. Um, but um, the one thing I regret about not doing uh, grad school and not doing some more conventional, and I've taken a ton of acting classes here in LA over the past years. And even I was just in a, a Shakespeare soliloquy class over the quarantine um, in July. Oldest person in the class by like 15 years. <laughs> Probably should have just done King Lear. But the, um, uh, the one thing I regret about uh, not having a conventional uh, um, theater background or conventional uh, theater school background is, you know, I missed the opportunity to, to do my student production of Love Labor's Lost. And I, I you know, my, my window to play Hamlet is pretty much gone at this point. And, and mm -hmm. to, do, to do the classics in a controlled yet safe environment is that, and I, I try to make up for that by taking classes and scene study classes and things like that. Um, I mean, if, if, if it is a priority to do the great work, then Yes, by all means, do do grad school, and um, I just can't promise anybody that it will lead to any sort of guaranteed employment. Okay, I mean, because remember that's a business as well. They are also yeah. looking to make make a living, and they will they will they will take people who they think have potential, no question, but they make no promises either. Um, uh, and just given how hard it is to be middle class in a place like New York or Los Angeles yeah. to to saddle anyone, for me to recommend anybody saddling themselves with grad school debt just seems like the peak of carelessness. Yeah, definitely. I just gave you a massive shrug as an answer. I apologize. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Okay. Who else? Good question. Hey, Courtney. Um, how was your journey with um, script memorization, and, if, and did it get better for you? Um, it, it, it. How was my journey? Um, a couple things. Um, I, I have a great app that I use called Off Book, um, where I record both parts, uh, um, both my parts and my scene partners, uh, into my phone, and then I can listen to it back entirely, or I can put it. I can set it up so that it drops my parts out, so I'm just sort of doing the scene with myself in the car. Um, that's one trick I've been using. Another trick that Jim Parsons actually taught because you know, Parsons on Big Bang Theory, I don't know if you've seen an episode of the show, but he has volumes of dialogue, a lot of which he himself does not understand. He used to, Brian, you'll find this amusing. He used to compare it to the way ABBA used to learn their lyrics phonetically. Yeah. He has, I mean, he's not, he, again, he, he is one of those MFA millionaires, but he does not have a background in the sciences. So he's, He's just learning words. What he would do is he would write his cue line on one and a half of an index card and then his line on the back and just run it like flashcards. If you were studying for a math test, same sort of thing. And he would keep those, um, those flashcards uh, tucked into um, the side of the couch uh, on the BBT set. And between takes, you just come out and drill them. Consummate professional. Um, he, another interesting thing about Big Bang that made it distinguish is that they did do it in five days, but theirs was a Wednesday to Tuesday week. And I bring that up only because that gave him Saturday and Sunday to get off book, to like hunker down when the script was really polished in its final stages, to hunker down with it and really learn it. And that, I think, helped him immeasurably. My journey has been... Um, much the same, you know, the better the script, the easier it is to remember. That's honestly the truth. Um, a, a shoddy script, one idea isn't gonna flow to the other and it's just gonna be, it's just gonna be memorizing a list basically. It's like going like, when you go to the grocery store and you've left your list on the, on the, on the kitchen counter and you're like, Christ, what did I need? What did I need? You know, it feels like that sometimes. But if you've got a really good funny script or a really good, um, dramatically compelling script, one idea will lead to the other and everything will sort of make sense in your head. And um, yeah, that helps. Other questions? Katie, I'd be shocked if you don't have a question. But don't feel forced, Katie. Don't I'm feel- I'm trying to think of one because I love the Big Bang Theory, so I'm trying to think of one. Um, 
was it hard to learn the lines doing the act like the, the way he the, talked the speech impediment yes um you know what i i it used it screwed me up the first couple times first off the speech impediment was not in the original script it was sprung on me in the audition um i auditioned for that role the night before they were going to start i auditioned for that on a tuesday night and the table read was the following morning and they'd had an actor who had booked a movie and couldn't do it. So they, they brought, they held an audition with like four people. We had all been in for the show before. I don't know. It's, it's part of the show is very quiet. If you're, if you're a super duper big bang nerd, super duper big bang nerd, you might know that I auditioned a couple times to play Leonard and didn't get it. Obviously. Um, I love Galecki. I wish him well. He's fine. Um, he's a tiny little man. Let him have it. But um, but I was in the mix. I was in. I was sort of on their 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 uh, their short list of nerds they had not yet used. So they brought me in, and I played him like this big alpha nerd. And Chuck Lorre suggested some sort of. He suggested a, a speech impediment. Bill Prady suggested something kind of subtle, like the Tom Brokaw liquid L. And what came out was this ridiculous Elmer Fudd thing. And Chuck laughed, and I I got the job in the waiting room. I went back to get my bag and, and leave, and they said, okay, you've got it, which doesn't always happen. Um, what I would do, however, is I would, uh, I would rehearse by myself. I would rehearse just the jokes without the impediment to make sure that I had the rhythm of the jokes first and foremost. That had to be, I had to make sure that everything made sense and his arrogance and his cockiness were, were all there. And then that's the meat. The gravy was the speech impediment. And then I would drizzle the gravy over, over the lines and, and that was hopefully how the week went. Um, but when rehearsing by myself, I wouldn't do the speech impediment because I just wanted to make sure I was staying true to the script. And then it's so funny. We always, we always used to joke about like, why doesn't he just avoid words with an R in them? Why does he just, why does he just not, why does he keep saying words that have R? And at the same time, they would never, I never once said the name Rajesh Kuthrapali. Nine, no, 11 years I did that show. And I never got to say Raj's full name. And it was just, it was just such a waste of an impediment, I thought. Uh, does that answer? Okay. Could you say his name doing the accent? Like doing the speech impediment? I'm a little out of practice, but it would go Rajesh, Rajesh Kuthrapali. See, I was not. I was not going to do the inside the actor's studio thing of saying, "Can we talk to McVeigh, please?" Oh God, it's the worst. <laughs> Let me get into character. <laughs> um, so, any last oh, Bernadette? Um, so, like, as an actor, do you have any like creative input, or like, have you ever written or anything like that on any of the shows or movies you've worked on? I have written some scripts that have been sold but not produced. Um, which happens more than you would think. And I have been given some leeway to pitch. Um, uh, I pitched a couple times and got stuff on, on Big Bang. On Speechless, where I was a series regular, I was in every episode. I felt a lot more comfortable, obviously, because this was, you know, it's my house sort of thing. You know, it's, it's your, there's, there's being a guest star and then there's being an actual series regular and, and never the twain shall meet. Um, so yes, the short answer is uh, I am given a certain amount of leeway. It helps that I've got a, a, a background in improv. It helps that a lot of the people I've worked with know that I've sold scripts and that I'm a, a writer on the side. Um, it, uh, uh, yes, you are given a certain amount of, of input. Um, you don't want to get too, precious and do the whole i'm sorry my, my character simply wouldn't say that um just you know steer clear of that kind of diva behavior but i think if you've got something to add uh a truly collaborative set will welcome that and um like i wouldn't necessarily try it on an aaron sorkin set but the work that i've done um yeah it's been uh it's been welcomed so and far like, so good how did you get your script like sold like if i'm like writing a script like how would you like what advice, I guess, would you give? Um, well, the worst, the worst vice is advice, but um, the, I'm not a great example for that because 
what I did was I established myself as an actor and I had an agent who also had a literary department and that literary department then helped me. So that's not, I mean, that doesn't help anyone who's getting on the ground floor. On the ground floor, um, uh, take classes. Um, take classes with, uh, with people you've heard of if you can. Take classes here at school uh, and send your shit out, send your shit to do blind submissions to agents, do blind submissions to managers, um, maybe write stuff that you yourself perform. Um, uh, there are, uh, especially nowadays, there's so many outlets for you to get your work seen. Um, um, be it, uh, uh, be it YouTube or, or Vimeo, if you want better definition, um, uh, I know a guy who got hired uh, at Conan. He lived in Wisconsin. He got hired as a writer on Conan ba off the strength of his Twitter feed. Off the strength of, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I'm drawing a, a total blank here. But uh, the, the one tweet I remember that made me throw my head back and laugh was, and again, this is just a single, this is not a single. He was a, a dad, married dad, living in Wisconsin, has a job, but is tweeting regularly so much that it caught the eye of the head writers at Conan and they interviewed him and they gave him a job and he lives out here now, he's writing for Conan. And um, the one tweet that, um, uh, the one tweet that struck me as really funny was, I went to pick up my daughter from preschool and she rushed into my arms and I picked her up and thought, damn bitch, needy much? And I, as, as horrible as that joke is, it's also horrifically funny and, uh, that kind of a Twitter feed apparently can get you a gig nowadays. You'd be surprised um, how people are finding uh, talent. There are no set gatekeepers the way there were 20 or even 10 years ago. There's a lot of ways to get your voice out there. Um, there's the conventional, you know, blind submission stuff that I was talking about, but there's, there's, there's blogs and there's Twitter and there's, uh, there's all sorts of ways to, um, to get heard. I'm just afraid we're going to get cut off in a couple of seconds. So, John, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming in to talk today. My pleasure. If, if any, if there are any follow-up questions or anything, anything we didn't get to, Brian, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll write back. I will. And maybe when we get Jamie in, you can come in at the very end or something and respond to questions. We can do that. Okay. But I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll send you a text after we're done here. Okay, great. Great. What do you have to say? Uh, no, thank you so thank much, you. guys. This was this was super fun. I really enjoyed this. This was really uh, this is a really thanks for listening to me babble for an hour. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much, John. Uh, and I will text you and we'll do a follow up. Okay, let's. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Nice thank meeting you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do the end of meeting wave. End of meeting wave, everyone. <laughs>